Journalism matters in our society. It's fundamental to the operation of our democratic system. It's a noble craft, maybe more than that. I came across an interesting line in a Huffington Post article recently. It read, someone very sexy once told me journalism is a sexy profession. <laughs> I have to say I can't quite say it myself, but maybe I'm wrong. If journalism was sexy, it might help to answer a question that has been puzzling me. Why are so many really bright young people still enthusiastic about studying journalism when career prospects these days are they're certainly uncertain. Why does including the word journalism in the title of a course apparently continue to guarantee bums on seats? I'm pleased that people still want to be journalists. And I, can I can't imagine a better job, but it must be obvious to everyone by now that we're producing many more journalists and more journalism graduates than they're ever likely to find jobs in the news business in its present state. A well-known American academic and commentator on media issues named Clay Shirky from New York University has attacked in quite stark terms people who encourage false hope among young would-be journalists at a time when so much of the industry is battling for survival. He wrote, pretending that dumb business models might suddenly start working has crossed over from sentimentality to child abuse. It's self-evident that under attack from new technology, print is in retreat everywhere. Earlier this year, an American ambassador, Washington's new envoy to Switzerland, chose to take the oath of office on a Kindle. Last year, recruits to the Atlantic City Fire Brigade were sworn in using a Bible app on an iPad. <laughs> if even the Bible isn't sacred, what hope do newspapers have? The answer is, in the longer term, not much. But they're not on their own. Eventually, the idea of television signals being transmitted through the ether will be just as redundant as print on paper. That almost certainly goes for radio as well. Communications Minister Malcolm Turnbull describes what the internet is producing as a universal Uber platform. Everything will be on the net, all on this Uber platform, accessible from any device, anywhere, anytime. What this will ultimately mean for journalism is still very cloudy. As you'll be aware, there's been a lot of pessimistic commentary about the future of journalism, especially quality journalism, and I've engaged in a fair share of it myself. Cost-cutting and job losses have seemed to vindicate the pessimism. I want to say to you tonight, though, that I'm starting to feel more upbeat about where journalism might be going and about the prospects for journalism graduates. My more hopeful attitude is based to a considerable extent on what's happening in the US. I watch American developments in journalism and in the media closely, not because of any cultural cringe, but because it's a way of predicting what will happen here. A crystal ball, if you like, that makes it possible to look a little way into our future. To illustrate the lag, newspaper advertising revenue peaked in the US in 2005, here in 2008. Mass redundancies hit Australian newspapers three years after the job shedding tsunami struck the American newspaper business. So watching trends there is a useful early warning system for us in Australia. It can also give us advance notice of encouraging developments. Before I go into Pollyanna mode, though, I want to talk about a couple of issues that come into the early warning category and which, in my view, have serious implications, particularly for my field of political reporting. The first is the growing ability that digital, digital revolution gives politicians, and others for that matter, to bypass journalists. The second is the near impossibility of political and investigative journalists being able to protect sources in the digital age. In an article earlier this year, John Lloyd, who's the Director of Journalism at the Reuters Institute at Oxford University, described how Barack Obama won the 2012 US presidential election by speaking to millions via social media. Lloyd then asked pointedly, who needs the press? It's an even more sobering question when you consider how Obama, having revolutionised campaigning, is now pioneering the use of social media and digital technology in governing. Lloyd's conclusion was, journalism now has to fight another threat which is as stark as falling revenue, irrelevance. I'd moderate that just a little, irrelevance I think is too strong, but we do face the threat, indeed I think the inevitability, of reduced relevance. Malcolm Turnbull is the Australian politician who best understands this sort of thing. You remember Tony Abbott's assertion that Turnbull, quote, virtually invented the internet in this country. I guess that puts him up there with Al Gore. 
Speaking at the Australian National University two months ago, Turnbull declared that politicians should not complain about the media anymore because they no longer need journalists as intermediaries between themselves and the public in the way they used to. Politicians, he said, have now got their own megaphones. Kevin Rudd showed the way. To a considerable extent, in the period between being deposed as Prime Minister by Julia Gillard and then returning to the job as the desperate last hope of a doomed government, Rudd kept his profile up through what amounted to do-it-yourself coverage. He was his own media outlet. It's open to any smart politician to do the same thing. With Twitter, Facebook and his own YouTube channel, plus a staffer with a $50 video camera and a laptop for editing, Rudd could deliver what was effectively news content to a substantial audience without having to rely on media organisations. And it helped him get coverage from mainstream media organisations as well. They quite often took his material off YouTube and used it themselves. I've looked closely at the Obama operation, not just reading about it, but also talking to people in Washington connected with the White House, or who've been connected with the White House. It really is impressive. But if you believe in the importance of watchdog journalism to the working of our democratic system, it's also of concern. Not that there's any possibility of turning back the clock. Two years ago in a Walkley Centenary lecture predicting that politicians would assume journalistic functions in the digital age, I said, they'll be our competitors as well as our subject matter. Well, in Washington, it's happening in a significant way. A New York Times article published under the headline, The YouTube Presidency, put it this way, Obama's team has led the pack to become the new media on the White House beat. The writer added, does that strike anyone as unsettling? Well, it strikes me as unsettling if it results in less contact with media that's not in-house. It's unsettling, unsettling if independent journalists have their access curbed or cut off. It's unsettling if it enables the administration to limit its exposure to the kind of probing by which governments are held to account all of which, it seems, is coming to pass. Let me tell you what I've learned about the engine room of the YouTube presidency, the White House Office of Digital Strategy. It is, in reality, a reasonably, a reasonably substantial news operation. It has a staff of 20 plus. Some are from journalism, some are computer nerds, some are policy wonks. There's a unit producing video with the videographers having unprecedented access to the president and everything he and others in the administration do. There are staff who specialise in social media, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, Vine, etc. Vine, in case you didn't know, I, I didn't. There's a social media app that does six second videos. There's an analytics unit gathering and studying data to work out how best to reach people and get them to engage with the administration. There are people writing blog posts and scripting videos and other content. And there's a team responsible for website design and infographics. I'd say that mix is pretty much what the typical newsroom is becoming in the digital age. Malcolm Turnbull would be pleased to know that the President calls the office my megaphone. He tells staff he wants it to get his message through to the American people unfiltered. In other words, bypassing the media is a key aim. The way the White House website puts it, the office, quote, uses digital platforms to amplify the President's message and engage with citizens around the country online. The product is pretty polished. If you want to get a taste of it, download the White House app on your smartphone. It's free. Tap the app and you'll see a blog, including photographs and videos that covers most of what's happening at the White House. What the blog has to offer today, I had a look before, just before I arrived here. Uh, President Obama chairs the UN Security Council meeting on foreign terrorist fighters. Uh, the Affordable Care Act is working. The First Lady, we've made tremendous progress in educating the world's young women. President Obama on the significance of civil society. Why can't, why we can't wait to uh, act on climate change. I mean, that's just a few of the, the things that are there today. You, if you tap the app on the menu, you get uh, what's called a briefing room. And that enables you to access all the White House press releases, transcripts and so on. The app offers a separate section of photographs of the President taken by the White House's own photographic staff, often at events or informal uh, activities that the White House press corps doesn't get access to. Uh, ditto a whole lot of videos. It's entirely flattering, of course. You're not going to see a tired or stressed or cranky President here. There's a section where you can watch presidential news conferences and other events streamed live. There's a favourites button so you can save your favourite articles, photos and videos. 
Now, the app is being developed further, just as some news organisations now send notifications to your mobile phone about breaking news or developments you might be interested in, the White House is going to do the same. If there's a breaking news development the administration wants to talk about, you'll get a message on your smartphone. The Office of Digital Strategy produces regular video messages from the President. At times the White House uses it to make public announcements via social media rather than to the press corps. It's responsible for a number of sophisticated websites. An example was a community channel on BuzzFeed starring Vice President Joe Biden and dealing with Obamacare. The State of the Union address has been live streamed through an iPhone app which then invited questions from viewers so the President could answer them in a White House produced YouTube interview a few days later. And there's West Wing Week. It's effectively a news bulletin put out every Friday looking back at what the President's done in the previous seven days. It's on YouTube, on the app, on the website. One experienced White House correspondent has described it as somewhat bitterly as five minutes of their own video and sound from events the press didn't know about. That's not strictly true. Public events are covered too in uh, West Wing Week. But what makes it so effective and so annoying to the White House press corps is the way the White House's own videographers are able to capture one-off candid moments that the independent media don't get to see, as well as events that uh, the mainstream used to see but now get shut out of or aren't even told about. It would be only a small step to turn West Wing Week into a daily newscast. I think we should watch this space. A Washington insider who seen the operation uh, at close range told me, we are the first administration to have the opportunity to tell our story ex exactly as we want to tell it, instead of having to go through ABC or NBC or CNN or Fox News to tell that story. And politicians have always yearned for a way to sideline journalists, to communicate directly with voters. Now with digital technology, they have the means at last. To put it bluntly, politicians and governments can report on themselves. They're much, much less reliant on journalists than they used to be. And because of that, they can be much less constrained about ignoring reporters or making it more difficult for them to access information. The White House Press Corps is starting to feel the hot breath of irrelevance that John Lloyd talked about. This was reflected in a report published last year titled The Obama Administration and the Press. It was commissioned by the US Committee to Protect Journalists and prepared by Leonard Downey Jr., an award-winning investigative reporter uh, before he did a 17-year stint as executive editor of the Washington Post. Digital technology, according to Downey, gives government many new levers for controlling the message. He wrote in his report of a strategy honed during Obama's presidential campaign to use the internet to dispense to the public large amounts of favourable information and images generated by his administration while limiting his exposure to probing by the press. Barack Obama, in fact, joked about all this at the annual dinner of the Gridiron Club, a journalistic institution in Washington. Some of you have said that I'm ignoring the Washington Press Corps, that we're too controlling, the President said. Well, you know what? You were right. I was wrong. And I want to apologise in a video you can watch exclusively at whitehouse.gov. <laughs> As I said earlier, my interest in what happens to journalism and the media in the US derives from the fact that it's like looking into a crystal ball and seeing what will happen in Australia. There'll be a time lag, but the Obama approach will be reflected here. No one should have any, any doubt about that. Just before he stepped down as White House Press Secretary a few months ago, Jay Carney said it would have been malpractice for him and others responsible for media strategy at the White House not to take advantage of the possibilities offered by digital technology. He's right. So don't expect our politicians and their minders to be guilty of that, practice either, that malpractice either. We journalists can whinge all we like, but the technology is there for politicians to change the game and they'd be mad not to use it. Canada uh, is interesting. The Prime Minister Stephen Harper, almost since he took office, has been at war with the national media. And he said openly he wants to bypass them. In January this year, he announced a new video magazine called 24-7, a week in the in the life of the Prime Minister, which he said would keep Canadians in the know. So Ottawa is well on the way. We know that Tony Abbott is not a tech head. Um, he's the bloke who dismissed social media as, quote, kind of like electronic graffiti. <laughs> and he attracted scorn when he said, it's pretty obvious that the main usage for the NBN is going to be internet-based television, video entertainment and gaming. But there are undoubtedly people around our Prime Minister who've taken notice of what's happening in the White House. 
Very early in the life of the Abbott government, a videographer was hired by the Prime Minister's office. Josh Wilson, a cameraman and video editor who learned his trade in the Nine Networks Canberra Bureau, so he's pretty good. Josh, because he's with the PM all the time, inevitably gets access to stuff that outside media don't. He shoots and edits a weekly video addressed by the PM that goes up on YouTube and is available to any media organisation that wants it. It's distributed by the Prime Minister's press office every week. He produces between 10 and 15 other Prime Ministerial video messages a week uh, for groups that the PM wants to reach out to. And he's crucial in the Abbott office's social media strategy, which predominantly means Facebook. Facebook's become very important for political messaging, and the effectiveness of Facebook depends on strong images. If you watch Insiders on the ABC, you've probably seen Josh without realising it. Uh, there's a clip there of Mr Abbott and President Obama in the Oval Office. One of Josh's tasks is to make sure that when people are photographing the Prime Minister or filming him, there's no one in the background to distract attention. Well, in the Oval Office, you'll see a third figure behind the President and Tony Abbott, it's Josh. Uh, he can laugh about it now. The Abbott, uh, 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 I think it's a claim to fame, by the way, the photo bombing the President and the Prime Minister. I don't <laughs> condemn him for that. The Abbott operation is uh, not primarily about bypassing the press gallery, not at this stage anyway. The justification is that adding someone with Josh's skills is part of the evolution of a more professional media office. But it is just the beginning. We got a look at the future yesterday morning, in fact. The Prime Minister, flying to New York to attend the United Nations tourism meeting, had a brief refuelling stopover in Honolulu. Back in Australia, a teenage terrorism suspect had stabbed two police officers in Melbourne. There was no media on the PM's plane, but Josh Wilson was there. Mr Abbott spoke with ministers and security officials on a secure line, then Josh set up his camera, stuck a microphone on the Prime Ministerial lapel, and Mr Abbott made a statement about the incident to Josh Wilson. There was even a backdrop with the Australian coat of arms and two Australian flags, presumably part of the Wilson luggage. The result was uploaded to YouTube, the PM got back in his plane, and as he took off, the transcript plus video and audio were being sent out to media organisations by the PM's press office in Canberra. Who needs journalists indeed? John Howard tried to use talkback radio to bypass the press gallery, but radio hosts are intermediaries, just like journalists. Howard could only dream of the day when it would be possible for governments to get out unfiltered messages by producing and distributing their own news content. Not only governments, of course, there's nothing to stop an opposition doing an Obama as well, and some Labor Party politicians are quite aware of the possibilities. One of them offered the view in a private conversation recently that opportunities provided to Labor by digital technology, combined with the damage that technology is doing to newspapers, meant the party would be able to stop worrying about the Murdoch press within two election cycles. Gough Whitlam saw no such light at the end of the tunnel 40 years ago when he incurred the disapproval of a certain newspaper proprietor. Bill Hayden, one of his ministers, commented that if Gough had walked across Lake Burley Griffin, one of our leading national newspapers would have published a story under the heading Whitlam Can't Swim. <laughs> <laughs> There's another point to be made in the context of digital technology wrecking media business models and fragmenting the industry. Weakened media organisations, having cut journalistic staff in a frenzy of uh, cost reduction, are bound to be less scrupulous than they might once have been about using subsidised content, material produced by others that doesn't cost them anything. So material from Obama's Office of Digital Strategy or produced in-house by Tony Abbott's infant operation or by the Labor Party as it gears up to bypass News Corporation, can be expected to find its way into the mainstream media. Beggars are not going to be choosers. That too strengthens the hand of politicians vis-a-vis -vis journalists and feeds into the relevance discussion. Anything that reduces the relevance of political journalism is bad for the health of our democratic system. Power won't hold itself to account. Governments are hardly likely to face difficult questions from their own media and politicians will only use the new opportunities available to them to distribute information on things they want the public to know about. The only way I see for journalists to deal with what will be a growing challenge is to apply traditional journalistic skills, especially the cultivation of sources, with renewed vigour, consistently digging out what politicians and others in positions of power don't want revealed as the best guarantee of continued relevance. Which brings me to the second matter of concern that I mentioned, the increasing difficulty journalists face in this digital era in protecting sources. If we can't protect them, 
they're highly unlikely to talk to us in the first place. And without leaks, without whistleblowers, democracy just can't work very well. They're absolutely necessary to keep the bastards honest, the bastards being our political masters. Again, it's instructive to look at what's happened in the US. The Obama administration has been marked by leak inquiries and prosecutions, far more than under any previous president. Journalists have been in the middle of them, often subpoenaed to face demands that they identify their sources, name their sources, and refusal to do so, of course, carries the threat of jail there, just as it does here. In mid-2011, at a conference on government secrecy involving journalists, lawyers, and intelligence officials in Aspen, Colorado, the journalists raised the matter of a proposed shield law to protect reporters from being forced to reveal their sources. According to Lucy Dalglish from the US Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, quoted in Leonard Downey Jr.'s report, the response from the government legal team was, you can get your shield law, but you've probably seen your last subpoena anyway. We don't need you anymore. In other words, it's no longer necessary to drag journalists into court to try to get the names of their informants, because sources can be identified these days by other means. Our contacts and movements can be monitored by the digital trail that we leave. Phone and email records, internet activity, credit card information, airline bookings, uh, toll road payments and so on, they're all accessible. And our mobile phone serve as GPS trackers. Julian Assange of WikiLeaks fame likes to refer to the smartphone as a surveillance device that makes calls. <laughs> Let's talk about phones for a minute. There was an outcry in the US last year when it was revealed that federal investigators had obtained two months of phone records of reporters and editors at Associated Press. The Justice Department secretly obtained a subpoena to compel AP's phone company to provide the records. The subpoena covered 20 AP telephone lines and switchboards, as well as the home phone lines and mobile phones of individual reporters. Details of thousands and thousands of news gathering calls by more than 100 journalists were seized, a veritable harvest of information about communications with confidential sources across all of AP's operations. It was widely condemned in America as judicial overreach, and the angry media reaction compelled Obama to tighten the rules under which such action could be taken in future. I'll tell you something sobering though, it could happen here without any judicial involvement at all. No need for a subpoena. And we're not just talking national security, which was the excuse for the action against AP. In this country, enforcement agencies, as well as ASIO, can get information from telecommunications companies without needing a warrant, as long as it's for the purpose of enforcing the criminal law or a law that imposes a pecuniary penalty or is for the protection of the public revenue. In other words, it goes well beyond police forces and crime commissions and anti-corruption agencies. The RSPCA fits the definition of an enforcement agency under our Telecommunications Interception and Access Act. In the US, uh, sorry, and this act is used to hunt journalist sources. A few years ago, after I'd reported details of a cabinet document that embarrassed the then government over a botched plan to monitor petrol prices, not national security, petrol prices. An Australian National University academic got a knock on her door. She'd been a friend of mine for 40 years, had nothing to do with politics, the government or the public service, or petrol. The two detectives were there from the AFP demanding to know why she'd spoken to Laurie Oakes on his mobile phone at such and such a time on such and such a day. Who knows how many other people I'd spoke to on the telephone at that time got the same visit from the Wallopers. It's not just phone calls, emails and internet activity are covered as well. Information handed over is restricted to metadata, who you communicate with, when, for how long, where from, that sort of thing. And in the debate going on at the moment over new national security laws that would compel telecommunica telecommunications companies to retain such metadata for two years, the fact that the contents of communications wouldn't be accessed is presented as a reassurance. Well, it's not very reassuring, and it shouldn't be reassuring for journalists. As my expert witness on this, I'm going to call Edward Snowden, sometimes referred to as the most wanted man in the world. Snowden, a computer expert, former CIA systems administrator and counterintelligence trainer, is the American National Security Agency contractor who leaked thousands of classified documents, mainly to the Guardian's journalist, Glenn Greenwald, exposing mass electronic surveillance programs around the world. The US wants him on espionage charges, and he's been granted temporary asylum by Russia. Whether you think he's a traitor or a whistleblower, Snowden definitely knows about surveillance. Here's what he said about metadata in an interview 
in Moscow with The Guardian. Metadata can be analogised to the details that a private eye produces in the course of an investigation. For example, the private eye might follow you to a diner where you meet a friend, you meet a lover. They see who you meet, they see where you meet, they see when you went there and they may even know the broad, de uh, broad topics of your conversation. Well, if you replace friend or lover with, uh, with source, you see the problem for journalists. Obviously, journalists can't do their job properly with a digital private eye following them 24 hours a day and watching their every move. Here's what Snowden said specifically about journalism in the digital age. An unfortunate side effect of the development of all these new surveillance technologies is that the work of the journalist has become immeasurably harder than it's ever been in the past. Journalists have to be particularly conscious about any sort of network signalling, any sort of connection, any sort of licence plate reading device that they pass on their way to a meeting point, any place they use their credit card, any place they take their phone, any email contact they have with the source. It's an important issue. However, with the threat of terrorist attack being used as justification for the sort of electronic surveillance and tracking I'm talking about, journalist concerns inevitably are going to be heavily discounted. That's possibly why media organisations seem reluctant to even raise the matter for discussion. But we shouldn't be reluctant. We should press the case for anti-terrorism laws that, as far as possible, don't infringe on press freedom. Bernard Keane from Crikey, who's taken a strong interest in this issue, has written that journalists, editors and producers need to get working knowledge of basic encryption, surveillance techniques and IT hygiene so sources can contact them with confidence uh, and information can be stored safely out of reach of authorities. But there are simpler actions we could consider as well. I was reading recently how a, a German parliamentary inquiry set up to investigate electronic eavesdropping now protects itself from online snooping. It's acquired a manual typewriter for the preparation of confidential documents and sensitive messages. They may be using typewriters as a sort of novel idea journalists could think about. Uh, there's certainly not much doubt we'll need to return to at least some of our old ways, at least. Richard Baker and Nick McKenzie, the star investigative reporters from The Age, talked about this in an address at the Walkley Foundation's Press Freedom Dinner last year. They said with surveillance technology increasing, it's harder than at any time before to contact a whistleblower over the phone or a computer without leaving a trace. They said that meeting over a beer or coffee face to face was the safest form of contact with sources. But even those meetings have to be set up and one call or text message from your office phone or mobile can be enough to put a source's job or even liberty in jeopardy. And Baker and McKenzie describe what they call today's tradecraft for journalists. Use a public phone if you can find one, but good luck with that <laughs> these days. And, and you can't call a phone box back anyway. Better to use a SIM card bought under a fictitious name or Skype your contact from an internet cafe. An American judge in a leak case I read about uh, not long ago said, reporters might find themselves as a matter of practical necessity contacting sources the way I understand drug dealers to reach theirs by use of clandestine cell phones and meeting in darkened doorways. So this is what we've come to. Forty years after Watergate, we're probably back to signalling sources by moving pot plants around on the balcony at night <laughs> and having midnight assignations in underground car parks. Sorry, scrub that. These days the car park would have CCTV. <laughs> a long time ago I had a source in the Defence Department who called himself Red Duck. When he wanted to pass on information or a document, he'd get a message to me saying, the red duck flies by night, which meant that I had to meet him at a particular spot on the shore of Lake Burley Griffin at midnight. Back then, I think he did it that way for the excitement. <laughs> but if red duck was around now, it would be necessity. And we both need to leave our phones slash GPS beacons at home, otherwise he'd be dead duck. <laughs> Despite all that, I'm feeling, as I mentioned earlier, a bit more positive about some aspects of the transformation that's occurring in the craft that I've been engaged in for more than 50 years. And I'm not Robinson Crusoe. The most recent state of the news media report from the Pew Research Centre in the US says in the opening paragraph that there's a new sense of optimism or perhaps hope for the future of American journalism. And I believe that applies in this country to the future of Australian journalism. Increasingly, it's possible to see a way ahead by which real journalism, journalism of substance rather than the clickbait or McNugget variety, will survive, survive and perhaps even flourish in the online world. 
So let me give you half a dozen reasons why I'm feeling a little more upbeat about where journalism might be headed. In the digital era, I think this is called a listicle. Though the pre-digital Bible beat buzzword to listicles with the Ten Commandments, I think. Reason for optimism number one, newspapers are still with us. An, inter an international symposium on online journalism earlier this year, the executive editor of the Washington Post, Marty Barron, exulted, we've survived, we're still here. Now he had the comfort of knowing that the, uh, the founder of Amazon, and therefore somebody who understands the internet, had just bought the Post for a quarter of a billion dollars and was investing heavily to ensure it has a digital future. But the point is right, newspapers have proved more resilient than many expected. It's more than five years since Malcolm Tucker, the foul-mouthed Scottish spin doctor in the TV series The Thick of It said, these are hard times for print journalists. One day you're writing for the papers, the next, time, the next you're effing sleeping under them. <laughs> but for the time being, newspapers here and overseas are hanging on while they adapt to and find ways to finance journalism on the Uber platform. There's now encouraging evidence that part of the newspaper market is rusted on and surprisingly unaffected by price rises. There's a hard core of newspaper addicts who'll stick to the habit even if it costs them more. Newspapers, especially quality papers it seems, can raise their cover price significantly without losing these print loyalists. Reason for optimism number two, despite the bad news we keep hearing about declining advertising revenue, falling newspaper circulation and job losses, Good journalism, quality journalism, is still being produced, and a lot of it. Carl Bernstein, who among, along with Bob Woodward uncovered the Watergate scandal and brought down a president, asserted with some passion in a recent uh, lecture that I saw on YouTube, he said that vibrant journalism is being done every day in newspapers, online, in magazines, and on television. He was talking about the US, but it applies here too, I think, with a vengeance. I know that because, as I mentioned, for three years until last May, I chaired the Walkley Advisory Board, which oversees the Walkley Awards and conducts the final judging. It was a privileged position because I got a, a close-up look each year of the best of the best in all forms of the media from all parts of the country. It included brilliant investigative reporting that in just those three years led to a Royal Commission on Institutional Sexual Abuse of Children, a Senate inquiry into dodgy dealings among Commonwealth Bank financial planners that cost thousands of Australians their life savings, a bribery trial involving a foreign subsidiary of a major government institution, corruption inquiries that rocked and keep rocking both sides of New South Wales politics, a string of inquiries into sexual abuse in the Defence Force, that one involved a Curtin graduate, not the abuse, that story, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so on. The assumption has been that investigative journalism in particular would suffer badly from the new media reality of diminishing resources combined with a speeded up news cycle and the requirement to produce for multiple platforms. But investigative journalists are still doing great work. Why? Well, if I can quote Carl Bernstein again, the instinct of reporters is to report. Reason for optimism number three, paywalls are starting to give hope. This is really important, I think. The matter of money has been at the bottom of much of the pessimism about the future of journalism. With traditional business models broken, how was journalism to be financed? While it was being given away, the future looked bleak indeed, except perhaps for an operation like The Guardian, backed by a charitable trust, or for media outlets able to depend on philanthropic supporters, or for publicly funded media organisations like the ABC and the BBC. So when the New York Times had a breakthrough in 2011 with its metered paywall, allowing some free access but charging for unlimited use, the whole industry breathed a huge sigh of relief. Various kinds of paywalls have now been tried here and overseas, some of them quite inventive, and a number seem to be yielding encouraging results. To the point where the prominent American news industry analyst, Ken Doctor, says, quote, from Minneapolis to Columbia to Hamburg, traffic often begins to grow markedly after the initial shock of a paywall. It may take months or a couple of years, but traffic is essentially reset and can be rebuilt. The way Malcolm Turnbull put it when he launched the Saturday paper in February, was that many media organisations are using porous paywall, paywalls to slowly train people to start paying for content, and it's working. Surprisingly, perhaps the 2014 Deloitte's Media Consumer Survey found that people aged between 25 and 34 are more willing to pay for their elders, more willing to pay than their elders, I beg your pardon, and, and that's obviously a great sign. Paywalls are certainly not the entire answer to the problem of funding good journalism into the future, but they're part of it, 
And charging for journalism provides what's been called a quality imperative. If you're giving news away and simply relying on high traffic volumes to attract digital advertising revenue, then what works best is large quantities of clickbait and crap. But if you want to sell something, it has to be worth buying. It's early days, but it could be that media organisations that gave redundancies to their best storytellers and allowed investigative resources to wither will come to regret it. I hope so. Reason for optimism number four, concern for quality is now affecting online outlets that used to scorn traditional journalistic standards and values. There was a deep divide between the traditional view of journalism and the new online approach. Because the internet's all about speed and informality and democracy, there was argued ideas about getting things right, checking facts before you're published, providing context, were old fashioned. What mattered was to get the stuff out there quickly. Things could be checked and changed later. If you posted something that was wrong, people would let you know. The internet was self-correcting. Truth would emerge eventually. Well, that sort of attitude is now less in evidence. The brash startups and the digital natives seem to have decided belatedly that credibility actually matters. After all, traditional values are now being embraced by online newsrooms at places like BuzzFeed. Originally, BuzzFeed was all entertainment. Its big thing was cat videos that went viral. Anything that was fun, big on the web, was core business. But now, after eight years, it's getting to well over 100 million people a month, and it's becoming a news organisation that packs some punch after hiring Ben Smith, a serious journalist from Politico. He's the editor-in-chief now. The cats and gossip and listicles are still in there, but serious journalistic aspirations sit alongside them. Ben Smith talked about the culture change he's trying to produce in an interview with the Columbia Journalism Review in March. He said people used to see BuzzFeed as a place where you could find really fun stuff, but not really a place you could trust. Now they're seeing it as a place where you can get your news. BuzzFeed's hired a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter to head a new investigative unit. BuzzFeed's narrative features and investigations will be edited, copy edited and fact checked, Smith says. It recently sacked a staffer for plagiarism. The lesson, rubbish that makes money on the net can be used to build a platform for more serious reporting. Reason for optimism number five, the idea that people would access raw information on the net without the need for journalistic involvement has proved overblown. In their book, Out of Print, Newspaper Journalism and the Business of News in the Digital Age, George Brock describes how the founders of WikiLeaks believed that information spoke most powerfully if not mediated by journalists. But they found that when material was, pre was presented online raw, without commentary or explanation, much of it was incomprehensible. So all their leaked documents hardly made an impact. Brock, the head of journalism at City University London, writes, their disclosures only reached an audience of any size when picked up by mainstream media. Julian Assange eventually adopted the technique of partnering with well-known newspapers. The WikiLeaks experience showed that information needs to be distilled, put into context and explained. Journalism is required to sift, edit and give meaning. This is encouraging evidence, I think, that journalists do remain relevant. Finally, reason for optimism number six. The storytelling capabilities and techniques available to us are greater than ever. New journalistic tools provided by digital technology are astonishing. Sig Gisler, administrator of the Pulitzer Prizes in the US for 12 years, said when he retired early this year, in many ways, we've entered the golden age of journalism. Now, I balked at the phrase golden age when I first read it, but the more I think about it, the fewer reservations I have. I table as exhibit A, Google Glass. Now, you, you probably know about Google Glass. It's something still being tested by Google. It's essentially a tiny video camera, computer and screen built into a pair of spectacles. An American journalist named Tim Poole, who does what he calls mobile first person journalism, got access to it through an early adapters program and tweaked it so it runs apps that meet his journalistic needs. He can live stream video from his Google Glass camera, access his desktop computer at home from wherever he happens to be and have files displayed in his field of vision, he use a voice translation app when he's in a non-English speaking country, in fact he's used it to order a gas mask when he was being uh, tear gassed in Turkey. He can see and talk to his producers back at HQ from thousands of kilometres away and chat with people on social media all while he's broadcasting. Poole has used Google Glass to cover riots, as I said, in Istanbul, and he covered the Occupy Wall Street protests with it in New York. He can do, do it all hands-free, which is important when he's in the middle of a violent demonstration or dodging plastic bullets. 
and they can't afford to be distracted by peering into a camera. The viewer sees and hears what he sees and hears in real time. I don't know about you, but for me it's almost enough to make an old hack wish he was just starting out again. And finally, to illustrate the point about these wonderful tools, I think the, the fundamental change we're going to see is a marriage of traditional journalism and computer science. You might have heard the phrase hacker journalism. It doesn't relate to anything illegal, nothing to do with news of the world. Hacker journalists use computer science skills not just to provide expertise in the presentation of information online, but more importantly to access and interpret data in new ways, uncover truths and report them, a core journalistic task. Combining computer science and journalism degrees, I think, will be the new in thing in institutions like this one, especially in light of the need for journalists to learn IT hygiene and encryption techniques to outsmart Big Brother and protect sources. Thank you.